So it's, this is my pleasure to introduce to you a friend and a colleague. Uh, her name is Claire Kellaway. You've probably read some of her articles. She's the Food Systems Program Manager at Opens Market Institute, and uh, she's a, um, is, which is a nonprofit organization that uses research and journalism to expose the dangers of monopolization and identify changes in policy to address them. She is a, a primary writer for Food and Power, a publication that provides original reporting and resources on monopoly power in food and agriculture, and she's written for outlets such as Time, Vox, and PM Publica, and appeared on NPR's All Things Considered, and Kellaway lives and works in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So please help me welcome Claire Kellaway to talk about very important issues to our organization. Claire? Thank you. All right. And thank you so much for that introduction, Bill. Again, so excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this convention. Again, my name is Claire Kellaway. I study issues of monopoly power and market concentration across the food system. And so I'm sure you all probably expected me to talk about concentration in the cattle industry or the packing industry, but I figure this is something you all live every day and probably know much better than I do. And RCAF has done so much important advocacy around the Packers and Stockyards Act and this issue that I thought I would talk about an equally important part of the food supply chain, um, the uh, grocery end of things. Um, I do have some slides. I guess I'm not seeing them. Are they, are they gonna project on? Okay, they're working on it. Great, okay, yes, I'm gonna be talking about retail. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things going on in the grocery sector right now um, that obviously have cascading effects down onto cattle markets. So starting with just understanding the structure of the grocery industry, um, this industry has become more consolidated over time, especially recently since the 1990s. Um, in 1990, the top grocery stores sold about, so the top four sold about 15% of all food. Today, the top four sell 35%, which might not sound as high compared to some other industries that you all are working in, but these national figures can kind of cover how concentrated grocery can be on the regional level. So um, by some measures, Walmart alone sells more than half of all groceries in one in 10 micropolitan areas, or sorry, one in 10 metropolitan areas and sells over half of all groceries in one in three micropolitan areas. Um, and just in general, uh, levels of consolidation can be higher on the regional level. This increase in grocery consolidation has happened in part because of Walmart's entry into the space, which I'll talk about more, but there also have been a lot of small mergers of regional chains or you know, local chains coming together that you might not know are together under one roof. So between um, just 1996 and 2000, there were over 3,500 individual grocery stores that were bought up or part of an acquisition. And then in the past five or so years, there have been some big mergers of Ahold and Delhaize on the East Coast, which combined brands like Giant and Peapod, Hannaford and Food Lion. Um, Amazon, which is obviously a dominant e-commerce retailer, has gotten into this space through the acquisition of Whole Foods, which has really changed some of their local procurement practices. Um, White Oak Pastures, which is a larger regenerative beef uh, supplier, was recently dropped from Whole Foods, in part, they believe, because of some of their increased centralization of purchasing. And just earlier this week, on Wednesday, Aldi, a German chain which is expanding, announced that they're buying 400 uh, Winn-Dixie and Harvey stores in the Southeast. Um, but by far, the biggest merger on the, kind of being considered right now, is the Kroger and Albertsons merger, which is really important for the West. Um, Kroger and Albertsons are the two largest standalone grocery stores, and this merger would create 
a network of over 5,000 stores um, and create a chain almost as big as Walmart and would represent a, a really significant concentration in this sector. And so what does this all mean? What are the effects of this? Um, for one, you're seeing fewer regional chains and fewer local stores, which traditionally were really important outlets for independent food companies, new packers to get started and walk to their local store and find someone who they could make a sales pitch to. That is increasingly not <laughs> what the sector looks like today. We have more uh, national level purchasing um, and just bigger and bigger suppliers or bigger and bigger vendors that want to deal with bigger and bigger uh, food vendors um, that make it harder to to break into the grocery sector. And then we also have this issue, which we can see through the Kroger and Albertsons merger, with companies that are already, you know, some of the biggest in their industry, who have, you know, all the bargaining and marketing power that they could need, still feel this pressure to come together because increasingly the largest grocers are competing on this bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis larger and larger uh, packers and food companies um, with the goal of not competing necessarily on uh, the most variety or the best service of, of products, but instead on who can have the lowest prices by squeezing suppliers, which of course uh, affects um, cattle prices and brings us to Walmart, which uh, you really have to talk about when you talk about how the grocery sector has changed. Uh, this company went from not selling groceries at all in 1990 to becoming the biggest U.S. grocer in a decade. Today, one in four dollars spent on food goes to Walmart. And as I said, in some regions, they have you know, quite serious control over the local food market. But they've also become an indispensable buyer for some of these large companies. So companies... You know, Walmart buys most of their meat from Cargill and Tyson, and these meat suppliers are incredibly dependent on that. This is a quote from Tyson's recent uh, annual investment report to the SEC. Uh, they have to disclose the risk of how much their sales rely on Walmart um, because it would have such a material impact on their business. Um, and this obviously gives grocers an incredible amount of power to pressure their suppliers that I think it is important to distinguish from just a general economy of scale. You know, in food, um, the most efficient way is to ship something is by a truck. And if, say, a frozen meat company can fill a truck and ship it to a Walmart distribution center, or they can fill a truck and ship it to a distribution center that's you know, a buying club of several, say, South Dakota grocers. The cost of doing that is, this is the same and is effectively as cheap as it can get. Um, but the reason that some of these large grocers can still demand a lower price is because of this power they have. Tyson cannot afford to lose its business with Walmart. Um, it could afford to lose its business with a handful of local grocery stores. And uh, yeah, this in turn makes it so vendors, when they have to make such concessions to what are called power buyers, uh, charge more to the independents. So I've talked, from, talked with local grocers who can buy some goods at Sam's Club for full markup for less than they can buy those goods from their wholesaler. And again, that's just a difference in who's bargaining for the best price. And it's purely just because one player has a lot more power than the other. Um, the other way that companies make up for this squeeze is by turning to their suppliers. So farmers and ranchers. Um, Got to take this chart with a little grain of salt because the retailer share here can also include uh, restaurants. So we know over this time period, restaurant sales went up, which is part of the reason why we see retailers taking a bigger share of the beef dollar. But in general, as 
grocers have increased their buyer power, we do see this transfer of wealth from suppliers to uh, retailers and a little bit more to packers also. Um, but yeah, this is also something that we see borne out in economic studies with workers. So at suppliers that are relying on a large portion of their sales from just one or two buyers, um, long-term studies show that those revenue-reliant vendors who are selling to just one or two people or companies tend to lower their workers' wages over time because they're, they're in a bind. They don't have anywhere else to turn. And I think that's interesting to consider when we see Walmart vertically integrating into processing. Um, and we have projects like Sustainable Beef in Nebraska that has you know, partnered with Walmart to have a minority share in their plant and is going to be selling most of their product to them. Um, on the one hand, for reasons I'll talk about in a little bit, that can make sense given how hard it is to find markets and get into these grocery stores. On the other hand, statistically speaking, you know, we've seen in the past that businesses with that kind of setup that are dependent on one buyer um, can be in a bad position in the long run for their suppliers. So it's, it's a risky position. Um, but why would a company want to take that risk? Um, that's in part because, again, a lot of these dynamics that make it really hard to access a traditional grocery store, so or any retail outlets. I've been talking a lot about grocery, but I got my start in the food sector working at a food service management company, a competitor of Aramark or Sodexo that serves hospitals and colleges and universities. Um, these can be really important buyers who buy you know, billions of food every year, represent local institutions that aren't going anywhere and could be critical what are called anchor institutions to buy and invest in regional food systems. Um, but as we, on that side, also have consolidation, have three companies that run nine, sorry, 75% of all the private food service contracts. Um, they increasingly work with really large buyers and have kind of national purchasing arms that set up um, preferred contracts with large vendors in exchange for rebates or kickbacks anywhere from 5% to, I've seen even 20%, the average of one study, it says the average rebate is about 15% cash back on all sales in exchange for access to essentially guaranteed purchasing from all of their many you know, outlets. So how this is enforced is a company like Aramark will have you know, individual chefs who in theory have purchasing power to work with who they want, um, but their performance reviews, their promotions are all tied to their level of what's called on, on track or compliant purchasing. Um, so these chefs have to buy 80 to 100% of their food from the preferred vendors who have negotiated a contract with the, the national buying arm for these companies. And so in antitrust terms, this in effect is exclusive dealing. It's an agreement to only work with one company in exchange for you know, rebates for money back. Um, and it limits the amount of money that can be spent with everyone else, with all the new competitors, large and small, who are trying to get into these really critical industries. Um, thinking back to grocery, there, these kind of payments happen, but um, not quite in such an explicitly exclusive way <laughs> all the time. There's, there's other ways that uh, companies give grocers money in order to secure a majority or the best portion of the shelf. So one of those is just getting into the store in the first place with a slotting fee. It's a one-time upfront payment that anyone has to pay to get on a shelf, and it can be really prohibitively expensive to expand into even just one store, let alone many stores at once. Um, and then there are also 
promotional fees that vendors pay to you know, have a display in a store or get into Albertson's coupon book or get the end cap of the aisle, you know, which is shown to boost sales. And these are also like impressively expensive, like an end cap uh, for a grocery chain just to be there, have your product there for a couple weeks can cost $50,000. Um, and so this obviously gives a benefit to companies that have bigger advertising budgets um, and frankly more monopoly profits to, to share with large retailers to ensure that they have a large portion uh, of the shelf. And then this is actually, I think, contrary to, um, yeah, some of the explanations of this doesn't have to do with an exchange of money, but more an exchange of information, and that's the idea of category captains. So some of the biggest brands have a lot of market intelligence and insights that they use to figure out how their products are doing, and they offer to share that with retailers in exchange for getting the privilege of deciding where products go on the shelf. Uh, retailers will defend this under the idea of we're getting all this free advice to you know, determine which products are gonna sell best and how we can boost our, you know, our sales. Uh, but in effect, this information is, is coming from a company and um, I've spoken with not necessarily meat companies but other large CPG companies and they'll admit to me like they can make the data look favorable to their products. And so unsurprisingly, when you put uh, you know, a company like Hormel, which has historically been a category captain in like the packaged deli slices, meat kind of products, um, I think they're going to favor Hormel products and, and give them the best position and determine where the competitors sit on the shelf. Uh, in fact, I was reading one study kind of about how great Hormel was as a category captain, and it was talking about how they were recommending that stores actually um, decrease their product selection. So in that case, it's a dominant company literally pushing competitors off the shelf, um, all under this idea that it's gonna help the retailer make sales. And so put together, what is effect does this have? Um, the, the theory of, in antitrust land is that this is a form of coalescing market power. You have a very dominant vendor that has monopoly profits to share, and it can make more sense for a dominant retailer to actually restrict their choices and enter into things like exclusive deals or agree to give dominant vendors large parts of the shelf because though they might be foregoing some potential sales from having a greater variety of products, they're getting free easy money in the form of these exclusionary payments. And so in the end, it's mutually beneficial to both parties um, and their market power kind of coalesces to work together. Uh, what this means in practice though is that dominant companies, it's you know, incredibly challenging to break into their, their share of the market because in all these different ways they've, they've paid to hold on to it and to keep it there. And I think this is something really important to consider as you know, there's all this new interest in building new packing plants and all these efforts uh, going on right now to try and make the industry more competitive and, and challenge um, yeah, these dominant companies. But so long as a lot of these marketing practices are in place, you have many, many new vendors competing for a, just a margin of the market and the core dominance is, is going to remain as such. So I did promise to talk about some solutions. What are some of the things that can be done? Um, first, we see that the antitrust agencies, the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission are changing the way that they think about mergers and acquisitions. And right now they're investigating uh, Kroger's acquisition of Albertsons. I think we can expect to see a decision on that in the coming months, and I'm really hopeful that they will challenge to block that merger. Um, critically, they've also done some work to uh, also take a stronger stance on vertical integration, um, which is new, and that's something that antitrust enforcers to date have largely 
dismissed vertical deals as not harmful, but we see um, this agency taking that more seriously. Um, in terms of buyer power, there's an underused law called the robinson patman Act that essentially says, you know, vendors can offer different prices where there is like a genuine cost savings, where it's like genuinely um, cheaper for me to sell in bulk or to work with this vendor, but any other discounts beyond that that are really more extractive because you feel like you have to keep your relationship with a dominant buyer um, would not be allowed. And so the idea behind this is it would level the playing field to compete more on actual business efficiencies and hopefully benefit regional grocery stores such that you know, there are more places to enter the market and more people to sell to for food providers. And then finally, just to plug my work, my organization, the Open Markets Institute, has a petition in front of the Federal Trade Commission right now to ban exclusive dealing as per se illegal, which means outright illegal, at least when it's done by a dominant firm. Right now it's assessed under the rule of reason, which creates a lot of you know, opportunities for companies to justify their exclusive dealing. And when a dominant firm is doing it, we think that it should just not be allowed. And so that's something we are trying to get the Federal Trade Commission to issue a rule on. Um, so yeah, with that, I'm not sure how much time we have left for questions, but that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, has your guys' firm done any uh, research on alternative markets such as direct? Because that's something that we see a massive uptick in. Mm -hmm. uh, farmers, ranchers deciding to not play the game and just go right to the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, Mike Calicrate's going to be speaking later about what he's doing. We're seeing White Oaks Pastures, Joe Salatin, Polyface Farms. Uh, just a lot of people moving that direction. Seems to me that if we just change where we're doing business, let those guys play their own game. You know, the consumer market, because of COVID, they couldn't get meat on the store shelves because we came center, became centralized. Mm -hmm. And yet you can drive through any rural environment and see livestock standing all over the fields, and there's just been a disconnect. But there is a shift. So I'm curious what your uh, organization has kind of learned in that sort of research to just leave the existing marketplace altogether and, and create stability in our food supply chain for America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. And I do think that's where we see like a lot of these new plants, like I've been looking at all the plants getting USDA funds and a lot of them are designed around direct to consumer markets. I guess I, that just makes me a little nervous because even though we have seen tremendous growth in direct to consumer market, it has been like really incredible. Um, in the grand scheme of things, the sales in those markets, you know, I mean, they are also often targeting like consumers who are already on your side and who are interested in this and like seeking out these type of products. Um, but just the volumes are so much more marginal compared to what's going through, you know, restaurants, grocery stores, that is just still where most of the American public is, is buying their food. Um, I think I looked this up, like in 2020, so during the pandemic, all direct to consumer sales, so online, farmer's market, um, kind of on-farm stores was about $3 billion of food sales, but like meat departments in traditional retail alone was like over $70 billion. So it's just, I don't know if we can afford to seed that market entirely to, uh, yeah, the existing players. It's just still so much of where meat's going. And I also think it's important to meet consumers where they're at. And I guess just, even though there has been more interest in direct to consumer marketing, I guess, I, I don't know. I also think we see trends in how people shop are kind of still within some of these traditional markets. So I would like both, <laughs> like I would like there to be both options. And I think 
um, direct to consumer is great, but I also, yeah, we're working on trying to see how you can make this playing field more fair also, if that helps, yeah. Okay, we've got time for about one more. Um, Kenny McCurlick, Jordan, Montana. Um, with the dollar stores moving into our small communities, um, can you explain how their business model works and mm -hmm. why it's so, so bad for us, our small towns and our independently owned grocery stores? Yeah, definitely. So yeah, dollar stores have been a huge, huge challenge to rural grocery stores. On the competitive level, the issue is because I guess I don't even fully understand how dollar stores are getting so much money to expand and where it's coming from, but their growth is amazing. I mean, it's like more than any other chain or type of store has grown at their pace, you know, than almost any other kind of retail sector. It's like amazing how many are being opened. And because of that, they've been able to build up this kind of buyer power like I've talked about. They also really specialize in Again, not actually offering cheaper products, but offering products that have a lower sticker price, but are like a worse value. So you're getting the price per ounce can sometimes be higher, but because they're targeting, you know, really, really low cost um, prod like sticker prices, then that's how they become really competitive. And they, they're not necessarily, they're just beginning to offer produce, but in most cases they don't offer fresh foods. And so consumers in rural areas will still want to go to their grocery store to get fresh food, but the deal at the dollar store is obviously better. And that is where small grocers get a lot of their profits is from the slight markups on more stable goods. And so often they're losing money on the fresh goods just to provide it because that's what people need to get it on the door, but they're making money on the stuff that now all of those sales are, are going to dollar stores. And so as a consumer, you can feel like you're supporting both um, and getting the best deal, which is fair, but from the small grocer's perspective, it's really you know sucking away their, their business model and their lifeblood. Um, so yeah, it has been a really huge issue in driving a lot of small rural stores out of business. Um, and yeah, you see some efforts to, to offer those produce, but yeah, it makes me nervous because it's, it's a continuation of all these, these kinds of, of issues. Um, and yeah, just shutting off another way to keep money circulating locally. So yeah, there has been some interesting work in ordinances to just not allow the proliferation of dollar stores, um, but I feel like there needs to be a better solution <laughs> other than just, you know, not allowing that kind of business. So, Claire, thank you so very much for being with us. Let's give her yeah, a hand. Thank you. Mm -hmm.